Good evening. Uh, usually when I give talks about um, uh, my involvement in the Curiosity Rover project, I tend to have a narrow focus and uh, perhaps because I have a, speaking usually to a technical crowd or a partially technical crowd. Tonight I've tried to uh, bring this into a little more context. I'll talk a little bit about what the work is actually going on to explore Mars in New York City, but also um, a little bit about why we're trying to do this work. And I will talk about curiosity. I'll get to it. Look at this beautiful image. It, you know, if anybody's familiar with the Mojave Desert, I mean, it just, you're just missing the scrubs and the, uh, the tumbleweeds. It just really looks like the Mojave. It's, this is the base of Mount Sharp where the Curiosity rover is now, and we are heading to those foothills. It's very exciting, but I'm going to get to Curiosity in a little bit. First, I wanted to talk about, um, I'm no historian, but as far as I can tell, the really big interest in Martian life started about 100 years ago when um, Percival Lowell and some Italian astronomers thought they detected um, canals on Mars, evidence of intelligent life. Of course, the image on the right was about the best image that could be produced with a telescope in 1907. So you got to imagine that they must have had a, a vivid imagination. <laughs> this continued on through the 20s and 30s with the Wells boys, H.G. Wells and Orson. They imagined a malevolent, intelligent uh, life on Mars. And um, I think that this stemmed mainly from lack of information. And it was really necessary uh, to get to Mars. The second war, after the Second World War, there were new spectrographic techniques. We learned a little bit more about Mars, but it was necessary to get to Mars. And another 20-year leap. And we have the fabulous Mariner 4 mission. Probably no one here but me remembers this. I was nine years old. And I followed this mission so closely. I was obviously a space geek at a very young age. Um, but this was a flyby. Can you imagine? Uh, this, this, is a, this is a great technical achievement, but we couldn't even orbit Mars in the 60s. We had to fly by. We take 50, 60 images a day on Mars today, every day. This took a total of 21 pictures of Mars for the entire mission. And the, the excitement was huge because we thought this is the first time we ever got close to Mars. First time. And we thought maybe we'd see streams, lichen, beds of trees, whatever. But what we saw was a place that looked like the moon. And I remember, I was really little, but I remember Carl Sagan getting on TV and he was trying to smile. But he was, <laughs> he was clearly disappointed. And I'm no wonder. They were really thinking that they had something here on Mars, and it looked like the bloody moon. <laughs> Fast forward another 10 years, and the Viking mission. This was another great mission, but why would we send a mission to Mars after we, the, the Mariner mission saw a lifeless moon? Well, I think it's because uh, the Cold War was still going on, and the Russians had an intense interest in Mars, and we weren't going to let them get there without a try. So we sent two landers to Mars, and not only did we send two landers, and there's Carl Sagan, by the way, standing next to it. He's down in the, on the left. He's kind of a character, and maybe some of you don't know him, but um, he's dead now. But uh, he was a really classy scientist, actually, and he was a great leader. Uh, I didn't know him because I, this is before my time. And these two landers were sent to Mars with a life detection experiment on it. We were going to discover life directly. This is unheard of. And unfortunately, the results came up negative. And there's some controversy about these results. But I can tell you, I know from NASA headquarters, the mainstream science community, this was no life was detected. And this caused a long fallow period. We were not going to go back to Mars to try again, maybe ever. And this is, I, don't, I haven't mastered the ability to make humorous slides. <laughs> <laughs> but it was during this time, this is a little side thing. Honeybee in New York, Honeybee Robotics, we're here in the city. 
You see all the big boys, the JPL and, and NASA Goddard, they worked on other things during this fallow period, but we were working on life detection technologies. The people, the wise men told us we were crazy to do this, but NASA had some money. We worked on these things while no one else was working on them. But then some things started to happen. And one of them, two of them were things on Earth. Uh, these were discoveries that life was much more tenacious than we thought. It was living in hot vents with temperatures of 100 degrees, hundreds of degrees. It was living in cold places, places without even light. We used to think that life required light. It does not. Life turned out to be ultra tenacious. Maybe we were thinking that we were too quick to think that life might not be around on Mars. Maybe Mars was wet one time. Now it looks like a moon. But if there was life there at one time, it was clinging. Oops. We also had this wonderful discovery, and this is a mind blower to me. This is true, apparently, that if you took all the, the biomass on the Earth, all the whales, all the trees, all the horses, all the donkeys, and the camels, <laughs> and you put them on a scale, they would be greatly outweighed by the biomass that's living inside solid rock. There's so much living material inside solid rock that it outweighs what's on the surface and in the oceans. That's right. So maybe the, if there were life, was life on Mars, maybe it retreated into the solid rock. So the momentum was building to maybe go back to Mars, but it needed a big push. The big push came, and it was a game changer in the middle of the 90s when this rock, Alan Hills, stumbled onto this meteorite in Antarctica in 1984. and. My friend, uh, who's dead now, he just died this year, Dave McKay, said he found evidence of nanofossils inside this rock. The Viking, which we left behind, proved that this rock came from Mars as a, a meteorite. And he did that because a, a small fossilized gas trap in this rock was analyzed and it matched the atmosphere of Mars exactly. So we knew that this rock was from Mars, and Dave McKay said it was full of life. This couldn't be proved, but President Clinton um, said that this was uh, important enough to switch all of NASA around and go back to Mars. And this was uh, very important. By the way, you know, life on Mars, it's, it's uh, you know, people think, uh, I've noticed that life, they take it for granted that it's, um, we're going to find life on another planet where it already exists. But I guarantee you, if, it, if it, it hasn't happened yet, we haven't found nothing. And if it does happen, it'll be a, a giant philosophical scientific clusterfuck, like of Com <laughs> Copernicus and uh, Galileo combined. It's going to be a big deal. <laughs> this started the great horizontal exploration of Mars. And Orbital infrastructure was put in place around Mars at great expense. This is to transmit data from the surface to the ground and also to take pictures. We want a sky truth and a ground truth. And first set of rovers in 2003, Spirit and Opportunity. Honeybee got involved with the rock abrasion tool. We made these little holes on Mars. We had a seat at the big table. Then came Curiosity, and I'm going to start winding up here. This is the beautiful rover that's on Mars now. Look at the instrumentation. It's a chemical laboratory. We're able for the first time to analyze the soil and the atmosphere of Mars, and we're looking for organic material. It's not life directly, because we are going through a systematic approach. We learned from Viking not to try to, direct, uh, to, to, to attempt a direct life detection. We're doing a systematic life detection. And we've already found, this is when the rover headed out to a place called Yellowknife Bay, that this was all covered with water once, completely. Water you could drink. It looks a little like the Mojave as well. Honeybee's involvement was building the instrument in the lower hand right, which is a sort of a robotic device to manipulate the samples on board the rover. And we've, we found very quickly that, um, you know, there's, there's been sustained liquid water on the, on the surface, organic materials are present, and there's a source of energy for life. We haven't detected life yet, but we're on our way. 
there's lots of oxygen and lots of carbon coming back in our readings. This is the uh, foothills where we're headed toward. This is Mount Sharp in the distance. To give you an idea of the size. That is about, the, that little black spot is about the size of the rover when it gets there. That's about five miles away from our present position. And I'll conclude with the next slide. This is an image of taken on the Opportunity rover of the, uh, an abrasion that we took with our, uh, by a micro, the microscopic imager on board Opportunity, which photographed this image of the abrasion we did on Sol 30. And uh, you may have noticed something unusual about this, but I came in to JPL early in the morning, about 3 in the morning, to look at the image coming down, because this is one of the first rat grinds we had performed. I was very excited by it. It was a woman from NASA headquarters, a scientist, Kathy Weitz. She, she was the only person in a big, vast, high-tech control room. We sat at the same monitor, and she said, did you see this? And I said, yeah, it's a great grind. It's fabulous. And they said, did you see this? And all I can say is I was stunned. It was sort of like that husband in the soap opera and when the wife says, little Johnny's not your son. <laughs> I was really stunned. And we literally sat there and I said nothing. Uh, to, and she said nothing. We didn't know what to say. But I did think, oh my God, you know, I've got to, we're going to have to issue, uh, American media is asleep. We're going to have to issue the, the, the press uh, release of all time. The Pope is going to comment by day's end. <laughs> And I'm going to have to talk to Charlie Rose tonight. And I'm going to have nothing to wear. My significant other would confirm that. This is not enough to prove there's life on Mars. But I submit to you that it's enough proof that we ought to keep on trying. Thank you.